there's one thing that I've just been hanging on to for dear life um, over the last, again, say it over and over again, but over the last uh, course of year or so, um, so many times uh, you, you just almost, I've come to points of what's going to go on, what's going to happen. There's so many things in this country that are happening and, uh, around us and things that, that we haven't experienced probably at least since the 60s. Um, and, and, and I don't know what, what's going on, God. Why, where is the hope? And, <laughs> and I ask God that question and I say, well, of course, God, I know where the hope is. The hope is in you. Uh, the hope is in your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's where our hope lies. And, uh, and that is that living hope that we always hang on to. So worship with us as we're singing about that, that living hope.
Ryan, can I use this one? All right. Well, that's a little bit better COVID policy. Man, Jesus Christ is our living hope, isn't it? Everything else is shifting sand. I have just, I mean, there's so many lessons that I've learned through this, and I would not sign up for a one of them. Uh, um, but, but here we are. I mean, everything else is shifting sand. Jesus is our only rock, our only hope, our only joy, our only source of life. And uh, we've been through so many trials and so many pain, I, I mean, in the midst of all of this, so much un unknown, but yet God remains the anchor whole. And so praise Jesus for who he is. And, uh, and, and so may God send renewal and revival to our land, to our hearts. I mean, I went to bed many times crying, saying, Jesus, I am so weak. And I, then I feel his strength. But in your weakness, Sean, I am strong. You know, I've been on uh, several boards and going through major trials, all kinds of stuff that I would have never signed up for, but God is teaching me about his faithfulness, about his power, about his work, about his grace and his mercy, and, and that he is our living hope. And then he has a plan. He sent, he sent Kira with us and, and brought the rest of us here today. Praise God, those little things. We don't take those for granted. Thank you, by the way. That was wonderful worship, and we got some more. But, uh, you know, as we go to prayer, let's remember Faye. Um, she... And so continue to pray for her. We're praying that God preserves her life in Jesus Christ's name. We stand on that faith, that, faith, that, that uh, sure foundation that, that God is a, a miracle-working God. And... Uh, um, and, and for our sake, Faye's, Faye's you know, uh, she's always said, hey, whenever the Lord takes me, I'm ready. You know, that, that's, but, uh, but we want it. We want her around. Amen. So continue to remember Keith, he's home, uh, has infection in his hand. And so uh, pray that uh, the medication, God, you know, turns that infection around. And pray for Joy uh, Mauser, our health and welfare. She's just stepped on the flat ground and heard her foot pop. And so she's. He's got a broken foot and uh, all of that with uh, um, health and welfare and the rest. So let's remember them in prayer. Uh, let me go ahead and start out praying for that. And then we'll finish with just some popcorn prayers. You guys get to pray out. I mean, we haven't been together in I don't know how long, way too long. And uh, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to sing. My voice isn't trained to sing anymore. I'm like I'm choking, putting cough drops in. And it's not like I have any. It's just... Uh, we're not used to this, and so, um, let, when, amen. Yeah, Chester. Okay. Amen. Thank you, Chester. Jesus, we do go into prayer, and we thank you that you are the source of all of life. In you, we live and move and have our being. Jesus, everything is about you. Everything started from you, and we'll go back to you. Thank you for who you are, and we ask for your mercy and your grace on these prayer requests for Chester, and, and uh, continue to remember him and, and the prayer request for this, um, this car wreck that was uh, out on Green Bag Road as well. Pray for all of the outcome and healing there, if there's any injuries. Jesus, we do thank you, and we, we love Faye, and uh, it's close to our heart, and, and uh, um, Lord, you are the great physician that heals our, 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 our diseases, our sicknesses, that takes away our sin. Jesus, we ask for your miraculous work even now. Holy Spirit, hover over uh, Faye in that, that uh, hospital. Give wisdom to those doctors and nurses. Jesus, we pray a, a, a miraculous healing touch upon Faye's uh, body that it would uh, begin to, to, to shed off this virus and, uh, Lord, and, and to come back to health. Jesus, she's in your hands. We place her there. We pray for Tim as well. Strengthen him, protect him, guard uh, his heart, and, and grow the faith inside of him as well. Jesus, we ask for your continued mercy and healing upon Keith and and this hand and the, the infection as well. 
for joy that this uh, bone would heal in the, in the foot, even as the doctor said, there's a possibility that it won't heal. Jesus, we thank you that we believe in your good report, Lord, that you would enable uh, this bone to fuse back together, no lasting uh, injury there in Jesus Christ's name. And Jesus, we pray for our nation. Jesus, we ask and we intercede and we, we confess our sins and our wickedness, Jesus, that you would cleanse us inside and that you would heal our land. We humble before you. Be with our leaders, our president and the, the vice president and the, the Congress and the state and all of the rest. Jesus, may they make godly and wise decisions. Jesus, continue to get our attention as you have in this time. And uh, we plead your mercy and may your kingdom grow in Jesus name and so as we finish let's just pray out just short prayers maybe it's just praises for who God is and his faithfulness to you in this time and then we'll we'll continue in worship
Christ the solid rock I stand. We sang it because that was my request today. I just, I, I wanted to just remind myself and, and, and have you guys be reminded of the fact that we stand on a solid rock in Jesus Christ. It won't move. It won't shift. It won't change. That's the rock that lasts forever. And I just needed to hear it. I uh, heard that song a lot as a kid and um, just thankful for the worship team. It's good to be with you. It's good to sing together. Um, nothing beats being in person. And I'm sorry that my, uh, me and my family contracting COVID hijacked our reunion and pushed it back a little bit, but God's still in control. Uh, one more announcement that I forgot to share or add to the announcement loop was the, uh, there's a married couple's supper and game night from 6 to 8 this coming Saturday. Now, there won't be child care available, uh, but it'll be a good time. So they're providing some chicken and uh, desserts and drinks and other things. They're asking that uh, everybody bring a side dish. So uh, get a babysitter and come out to the church and enjoy some time from 6 to 8. And, uh, and if you have any questions, you can talk to Marianne Davis there in the back or Jeff in the back, the dynamic duo. If you don't know, Jeff is head of our men's ministry and Marion's head of our women's. And so uh, they like the tag team. So uh, thank God for them. Today's sermon is entitled, This is My Story, How to Share Your Testimony. How to Share Your Testimony. Anytime I see in Scripture a record of someone sharing their testimony, uh, I'm deeply tuned in and interested. Uh, whether it was Peter on the day of Pentecost or Stephen as he's brought before the Sanhedrin. I want to know what they say, but I also want to know what they don't say. Uh, I want to know what, what, what the Holy Spirit helps them and deems essential for people to hear in those moments as they're sharing their testimony. And so today we get to hear Paul's testimony. So this is really exciting. Let me set the stage for you, whether you've been with us or not. This will kind of catch you up a little bit. Um, Paul is in Jerusalem after another missionary journey, and God has revealed to him directly and also through other believers that when he gets to Jerusalem, persecution and imprisonment await him. And so he goes anyway, knowing that this is still God's will and plan as the Holy Spirit's leading him, and it's the will of God the Father. And uh, he goes and he meets with the leaders uh, in Jerusalem, of the church in Jerusalem, and he discovers that there's a large group of Jewish Christians that are spreading false rumors about him, untrue rumors, uh, that he is against the Jewish law, that he's against circumcision, that he's an, an enemy of their faith and their tradition. And uh, so they, they come up with a, a plan for Paul to be found blameless. They ask him to assist in the purification ceremony for four believers um, who are taking a Nazarite vow. Uh, and so this would prove to people that not only is he following Jewish law, but he's willing to participate in some of the more extreme measures of the Jewish law. Uh, and so he, he joins in on this. Now, while he's in the process of helping these guys out with their Nazarite vow, some Jews from the province of Asia, where Paul has spent most of his time on his missionary journey, show up and they see him in the temple and they start spreading another rumor, another false rumor, that Paul has brought a Gentile into the inner courts. And then it just causes the whole city to come into a, a, a riot really quickly. Um, this mob forms. And so they drag Paul out of the temple and then they shut the gates of the temple behind. The mob begins to beat him up, attempting to kill him, until the Roman guard catches wind of what's going on, and they get involved and they rescue him. Now the Roman commander that shows up on the scene tries out real quickly to find out who this guy is, what's caused this mob, this riot to occur, and, and he can't get a straight answer. Every person says something else. Some people don't even know why they're there. And so we see in, in some ways that Paul is a victim of circumstance, right? Uh, all the anger, all the frustration, all the aggression that these Jews are having about their life and, and living under the oppression of Rome and, and personal frustration, they're just kind of venting it out on them. Have you ever had somebody just vent their frustration on you? 
and you just didn't deserve it. I mean, this is COVID time, right? So this has happened more often than not, that somebody that you know or somebody that you don't know at all is just basically throwing up on you with all the stuff that's going on in their life. That's happening to Paul, but with lots of people who have no inhibitions about trying to end his life. Thankfully, the Roman guard doesn't allow Paul to just be murdered. But they take him to the Roman fortress that's just outside the temple. And the crowd gets so aggressive, even while the Roman guard has him, that they have to the, the, the soldiers that are escorting him have to put him on their shoulders like crowd surfing and take him up the stairs to get him out of the chaos. Once at the top, Paul asks this Roman commander if he can speak to the crowd. And it amazes me that even at the point of his own death, he's thinking about how to share Jesus Christ with people. The Roman commander is astonished that he's speaking Greek to him because he assumed that Paul was some Egyptian revolutionary. But Paul clarifies that he is a Jew from Tarshish, and so the commander gives him permission to address the crowd. When he starts to address the crowd, he speaks in another language. He speaks in Aramaic, which causes the crowd to get completely quiet because that's the language that most of them speak. And so that brings me to the first point of my message. Learn to speak the language of multiple people groups. If you don't speak a language they understand, you will never reach their hearts. You'll never reach their hearts. For some of us, this means that we have to learn a foreign language. That's exactly what the Depews are doing right now as they're trying to learn Hungarian. If you think about Mackenzie Baker, I guess she's Lother, Lother, Lother now. Uh, uh, she's also probably going to have to learn other foreign languages as she's on the mission field with YWAM. You know, we, we, we talk about the Depews a fair amount, and uh, we, we don't talk about Mackenzie as much. I don't know why, maybe because she's younger and youthful, and, but uh, we need to remember Mackenzie in prayer because she's on the mission field as well. But we also have Kristen Rexroad, who's uh, involved with InterVarsity in her backyard and in different college campuses, and, and so... You don't think, I mean, we probably don't think about this, but Christian has to learn how to communicate with lots of different diverse groups on a college campus. And so it's important that you understand who you're speaking to. You need to speak in such a way that you can connect with the people you're trying to reach. Um, know enough about different people, groups, and cultures that you can speak a language they'll understand. I mean, we adapt even how we speak to kids, right? I've been at home with my kids doing the uh, homeschool thing while they're, uh, you know, trying to get through this process of, of uh, quarantine and everything else. And it's amazing how different teachers relate different to kids depending on their ages. I mean, if Judah's K-5 teacher talked to me the way she talks to Judah, I, 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 would, I would think there's either something wrong with me or something wrong with her. But he's a five-year-old, and so you've got to communicate differently. And... Uh, I remember when I was teaching in Myanmar several years ago, be in prayer for Myanmar, by the way. Um, there, there's some changeover. There's a possible coup going on in leadership, and so our brothers and sisters in Christ need our prayers in that country. But I remember when I was um, preaching there a few years back and I was having to speak through an interpreter, I kept thinking in my mind, i got to use short sentences. i got to give room for pauses for interpretation. And I can't use common phrases in the U.S. that they won't understand, like, that's a piece of cake, or I'm just shooting the breeze. That won't translate real easily to the people that are listening. And uh, you got to take the time to know people to whom God's leading you to. And so let's start into Paul's testimony. Acts 22, verses 1 and 2. Brothers and esteemed fathers, Paul said, listen to me as I offer my defense. When they heard him speaking in their own language, the silence was even greater. Like I just related, speaking in their own language gave Paul their immediate attention. He's not demanding that they try to learn another language in order to hear his message. Uh, he does his best to reach them right where they are. Um, and so, again, let me encourage you, as always, meet people where they are. Know your surroundings. Hear enough of their story. 
take enough time to observe what their lives are like in order to be able to communicate clearly to who they are. Don't talk down to anybody, but relate to them. That's a real challenge sometimes, right? That, that when we get uncomfortable in our own skin, we want to come across as authoritative, and before we know it, we're talking down to people instead of just connecting with them because we're nervous or afraid or we don't know how to do it. Just relax. Just relax and, and understand who you're addressing. The other thing is how Paul addresses them. This mob that tried so violently to kill him moments before, he calls them brothers and esteemed fathers. As he stands there beaten, bruised, and bleeding, only the Holy Spirit can enable us to see people that way. Only the Holy Spirit can enable us to see brothers and fathers from a murderous crowd, right? I don't think Paul's just saying this either. The reason that he's willing to risk his life to bring the gospel to the people of Jerusalem is because they're family to him. And so this, this good news about Jesus, he says, I, I'm bringing it to you. I'm being real with you. Because you're real people that need to hear this. And uh, you're important to me. I love you. You're my brothers. You're my esteemed fathers. Now the look on their face may not say that. But people's reactions to you or reactions to the gospel should not dictate your attitude toward them. The love of Jesus should be the compelling force. He also doesn't separate himself from them. Uh, he doesn't make himself better than them or greater than them. And, and again, he sees them as family. Um, folks, we can always be respectful and courteous no matter how poorly or disrespectfully we are treated. Um, we can always do that. You know, we can make excuses for why we're acting inappropriately or angrily or whatever else, but that doesn't fly with Jesus. He is the one who's leading and guiding our heart and life. And, and when we uh, succumb to those kind of reactions, we're failing to look like the God we serve. And so this contrast allows people to see Jesus shining through. We just tried to kill this guy, and he's calling us brothers and, and esteemed fathers. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the ability to not repay evil with evil shows that there's something supernatural going on in Paul. And, uh, and they see the face of Jesus behind his words. Let's keep reading. Verses 3 through 5. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, and I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. As his student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you today. And I persecuted the followers of the way, hounding some to death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The high priest and the whole council of elders can testify that this is so, for I received letters from them to our Jewish brothers in Damascus, authorizing me to bring the followers of the way from there to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. You know, sometimes when we're trying to understand or analyze a teaching, you begin with what is not said or done instead of what is said or done. So Paul in his address to the crowd, does not run immediately to what just occurred. He doesn't seek to defend his actions in the temple, nor does he go out and accuse and point out all their faults and all their flaws and how wrong they are. And uh, I think that's why many of our testimonies fail, isn't it? We're so quick to defend ourselves. We're so quick to lash back out at the accusations made against us, we want to throw it right back at the people who are throwing them at us. And, and so we can't be too quick to point our finger. And what God calls us to do in our testimony is to be transparent ourselves, to make ourselves more vulnerable, in a sense, in, in, in a way to open up our life to individuals. See, Paul knows that the majority of the people in this crowd do not know who he is. They don't know anything about him. In fact, some of them, as we've already attested to, they don't even know why they're there, right? And he says, if I'm going to convince you of anything, you've got to know who I am. You've got to know where I come from. If you're going to believe anything that I'm going to tell you, 
I got to lay a foundation of who I am. And so a lot of what's going on in this whole passage is, is a case of mistaken identity. So how does Paul identify himself? Interestingly enough, instead of trying to separate his identity from the violent mob, this is you and this is me, instead he relates to them. He says, I wasn't born in Israel. I, I'm not from Jerusalem. I don't know if they would be called Jerusalemites or what. He says, I'm not from here, but I was trained and educated here. In fact, my teacher was a guy named Gamaliel, which uh, by this time Gamaliel's probably dead. But everybody would know Gamaliel, the great teacher. And so automatically it would give him authority in this group. He reveals to them, not only did he follow Jewish laws and customs, I know it well enough to be teaching it. Okay? So it's not of, I'm ignorant of Jewish law and custom. I know it thoroughly. And then he says this, not to separate himself from them, but to show that he has the equal passion and zeal that they do. For he says, I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you today. He took their negative actions against him and finds a positive core motivation of their heart. We have to do this when we seek to tell people about Jesus. Most people do what they do out of a good and right motivation from their perspective. Not many people intentionally act out on bad motives. Most people can find some redeemable quality to why they do what they do and they feel justified in it. Paul recognizes that they're zealous for God. He says, that's good. It's good to be zealous for God. I was just as zealous as you are today. You who are trying, and he, didn't, he doesn't say this, he could have. You who are trying to kill me today, I'm like you. No, but he does connect with their zeal. I was passionate about the law, just like you. And so when you hear that, can you sense the walls coming down a little bit? He's not separating himself from them. He's drawing them closer. Brothers and esteemed fathers, we share a same zeal and passion for God. But then he reveals just how extreme he was, if not more extreme than the mob that day. He admits to hounding the followers of Jesus to death throws them in prison. I threw men and women in prison. And so to some in that crowd, they might have been like, ooh, whoa, this guy is a little more extreme than I like. He's admitting to killing people. He's admitting that he would throw women in prison. Women who have children, he's separating families. What kind of guy is this? Like, it would, it would not only, for, so for a bit, he connected with them, but now he's even willing to put himself in a negative light. I took the most extreme stances possible. But I think it would also identify him with the mob itself. In my zeal, at that point in my life, I would have been part of this mob. I would have been leading this mob. So again, he, he's not pushing them away. He's embracing them saying, I get you. I understand. I understand your anger and your frustration and all the rest. I'm not different from you. But he also backs up his claim with fact that he had the support of the high priests and the whole council of elders. He was a tool in the hand of the synagogue. Um, and he had letters of authority to go to Damascus and Syria and bring back those claiming to follow Jesus for trial and imprisonment. And I am sure that these are not things that Paul is proud of. In all reality, he's ashamed of it. Guys, are you proud of your extreme sinful stances in your life? Are you eager to go out and share with strangers all your deepest, darkest failures and sins? No. None of us say, hey, let me tell you how awful I've been in my life. No. No. But Paul here doesn't hesitate to do that. He was responsible for the death and pain of some of those who were his brothers and sisters in Christ. It would be hard to live with that, I think, at certain times, right? 
that I broke up families. I destroyed lives. Something changes in us, though, when Jesus dwells in the core of our being. We realize that everything that's happened in our life up to that point in time is part of our story, and we cannot change it. We cannot deny it. And when Jesus redeems us, He also redeems our story so that the things we are now ashamed of allows us to relate and connect to people right where they are. It enables us to show a bridge. You think I'm so different. You think that I am so unreachable. But I was you. I was you or worse than you. But here's a bridge I'm going to show you to where I am today. And Jesus is that clear bridge. So let me tell you, do not be afraid to share your past sins and failures in your testimony. It's part of your story. It's part of your story. What other people are so ashamed of that they'll never tell, we can proclaim boldly because that is not who we are. That is who we were. There is real change in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. In Jesus Christ, there's real change. You can be different today than you've ever been before. A full switch. Brand new. New car smell, right? You may be driving an old jalopy. If the old jalopy is your life, When you receive His self-giving sacrifice for you, man, you're driving a Buick out of here today. Brand new, smelling great. No problem on the snow. New tires, right? That's how it is with Christ. And so you don't mind saying, hey, I used to drive an old jalopy. It broke down on me all the time. I was ashamed to go to certain parts of town because I didn't want people to see me driving that thing. You can tell the story because that's not who you are now. Get what I'm saying? We cannot leave out the disease He's cured us from. Nobody wants to talk about their diseases. But you can't provide a cure if you can't show people how far you've come. Let's keep reading. Verses 6 through 13. As I was on the road approaching Damascus about noon, a very bright light from heaven suddenly shone down around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus the Nazarene, the one you are persecuting. The people with me saw the light but didn't understand the voice speaking to me. I asked, what should I do, Lord? And the Lord told me, get up and go into Damascus and there you will be told everything you are to do. I was blinded by the intense light and had to be led by the hand to Damascus by my companions. A man named Ananias lived there. He was a godly man, deeply devoted to the law and well regarded by all the Jews of Damascus. He came and stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And that very moment, I could see him. Now, not everybody has a dramatic salvation message. Paul's the only person that I know of that was blinded by a bright light, saw the resurrected Jesus, and, uh, and was dramatically changed when God enabled him to have his sight back at salvation. He's the only person I know of that had that exact experience. Um, but, guys, this was part of Paul's story. He had to share this. He has to show the people how he went from one extreme to another. How do you go from uh, imprisoning and killing Christians to choosing to be one of them? Well, for him, it was this Damascus experience. And, and, and again, the people listening to that today, I, I try to put myself as I read this story as somebody in the crowd, right? And you're thinking, whoa. Either you're thinking, this guy's nuts, or... This has to be true. Either way, you're you're on the journey with him. He's walking you through his life, and you get to this point. And the thing about your testimony, guys, is people can't argue against your experience. They can believe you or not believe you. 
but your experience is your experience. Do not hesitate to say, this is what I experienced. You know, I've, I've shared with you before part of my testimony um, about God speaking to me about having a son years before I was able to adopt my son. There's been different moments in my life where God has spoken to me in dramatic ways. I shared with you when I was a teenager and, and I was on a date and, uh, and my dad was, was going to offer to drive us home, but he didn't want to embarrass me, but he knew something was wrong and he prayed for me the whole time after I dropped her off at her house and I was coming home and got into an accident. I wasn't even in the driveway before he was at my car window asking if I was okay. You see, those are those you know, dramatic moments where God did something exceptional in my life and to Joe Schmo, it may seem too fantastic. But that doesn't matter because it happened. It's part of my story and I gladly share those things. Um, his uh, experience on the road to Damascus was essential to his testimony. And, and so Paul's basically saying, I met Jesus. That's why I changed. I literally met him. He showed me that I was persecuting him. And he could have destroyed me with his awesome power that blinded my eyes. But he didn't. And that's a powerful message. And it's as if he's saying, I believed I was God's servant. I was his zealous messenger. I believed I was right and good in my actions until I met Jesus and I realized I was not on God's side. I was his enemy. And instead of destroying me, he spared me. Isn't that most of our testimonies? Most of us don't live in sin because we believe ourselves to be awful and wicked. We think we're living right. You ask anybody on the street if they're going to go to heaven or not, and if they believe in heaven, they're going to say yes. Why? Because I'm a good person. We all think we're right and good in our own eyes. But when we have an encounter with God in a special way, and we see how awful and wretched and sinful we are in our own strength and power, and He doesn't destroy us, but redeems us and calls us His sons and daughters, that's something worth talking about. I don't know if that was your experience, but for me, that was it. God, I don't deserve for You to even look on me. And He says, You're my son. I love you. i got a plan for your life. Paul also adds... Ananias to his testimony. He describes him as a follower of Jesus, someone who's godly, but also devoted to the law and well regarded by the Jews. And so he's trying to show in his testimony that Jesus and the good news about Jesus is not in contradiction to Jewish law and their customs. He's saying the first guy that I met when God spoke to me was this guy Ananias in Syria, in Damascus, and all the Jews liked him. He wasn't against the Jewish faith and custom. He also uses Ananias' character as a testimony as well because Ananias, knowing who Paul was, quickly calls him brother. Brother Paul. I love that. Not murderous Paul. Not persecutor Paul. Brother Paul, receive your sight. And that's who Jesus is. He's not an enemy, but God Himself. A friend who's gracious to those who are persecuting Him. Isn't that what Paul's doing in this instant? Think about that. They literally tried to beat Him to death and kill Him. And he says, Brothers and esteemed fathers, I'm giving you the truth that can save your life. I don't judge you. I don't hate you. I don't want revenge on you. I simply want to show you the same grace and love that God has shown me so that you can be my family. That's the voice of Jesus. They're literally seeing Jesus in Paul as he gives his testimony. And there's been nothing in his message to the masses who just tried to kill him that is mean or accusatory, is it? He's not being aggressive with, with any kind of this is who you are. Never once has he mentioned who they are. He's only talked about Jesus and what Jesus has done in his life. He's relating to them. All right, let's keep reading, 14 through 23. Then he told me, the God of our ancestor, ancestors has chosen you to know his will 
and to see the righteous one and hear him speak. For you are to be his witness, telling everyone what you've seen and heard. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and fell into a trance. I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, Hurry, leave for Jerusalem, uh, for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. But Lord, I argued, they certainly know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And I was in complete agreement when your witness Stephen was killed. I stood by and kept the coats they took off when they stoned him. But the Lord said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listening, uh, the crowd listened until Paul said that word. Then they all began to shout, Away with such a fellow, he isn't fit to live. They yelled, threw off their coats, tossed handfuls of dust into the air. Let me go back to the beginning of the section before we get to that end. Paul next explains why he lives the way he does. Why in the midst of them trying to murder him is he addressing the mob? Because God chose him to be a witness to who? To everyone. And so Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, in any circumstance and situation, is looking for an opportunity to testify to what God has done in his life. What God has done in his life. No exclusion. And I think the greatest, most miraculous thing about Paul coming to Jesus is not his healing from being blind, but that Jesus immediately cleanses him and forgives him for his sins. Have you ever noticed that about Paul's testimony? Does God demand eye for an eye? Paul, you beat and imprison my followers. Before you can be right with me, I'm going to beat you and I'm going to imprison you and I'm going to take your life. Does God do that? No! He gives him grace. He says, be cleansed in my shed blood for you. Be made new. Be changed. Be transformed. This good news is astounding and should be astounding today. For all the terrible things that we have said and done, no matter how justified in the moment we felt to do it, when we come to Jesus, He doesn't make us pay for any of those awful things. He just says, admit your sin, repent, be washed clean, and live for Me. That is the Gospel. So we don't need to waste our time pointing out people's flaws and sins to them because if they choose to follow Jesus, it doesn't matter what they've done. Let me say that again. That's good news. It's not your job to point out people's flaws and sins to them because once they give their life to Jesus, it's no longer who they are. Doesn't that free you? And as you're thinking about how you're going to share your testimony to people, that it's okay to identify them. It's okay to connect with them. It's okay to say, hey, I, I'm, I used to think that way. Yeah. I deserved the worst punishments possible. But the crazy thing about Jesus is He didn't make me pay Him back. Instead, He just took me in. Astounding. Now, I'm not much of an NBA fan anymore. But I, when I was younger, I'm trying to look around, there's nobody in the room that's uh, about the age. When I was a teenager, I was a big Boston Celtics fan. You know, when Larry Bird was still around, and Kevin McHale, and Robert Parrish, and DJ, the whole crew, right? And, and near the end of, of the uh, Celtics run, there was another team that came up that was really good. And they were a bunch of dirty players. The Detroit Pistons. I love to hate the Detroit Pistons. Not as much as the Lakers. Lakers will always incur the most you know, basketball hate in my book. But the, the, the Pistons were right behind. And they had a player on there named Dennis Rodman. Anybody here a Dennis Rodman? Yeah. And there's another team during that time that, that was having a rise, and that was the Chicago Bulls, right? Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and Bill Paxson, the whole crew. And in, as the Bulls were coming up, the Pistons won two championships and got the best of the Bulls. And the Bulls 
if you've ever watched any of the documentaries or stuff on, on the Bulls, they hated the Pistons more than I did. And they hated Dennis Rodman. Well, a few years later, Dennis Rodman ended up with the San Antonio Spurs, and the Bulls were struggling with toughness and rebounding and all the rest. And so Dennis Rodman was available as a free agent, and they had a chance to bring him in as a Chicago Bull. And so they did. They brought him in, and he became part of the team. Now, as much as they hated Dennis Rodman before, because he was a piston, when he became part of the team, they, never, they didn't see him as a piston anymore. They didn't make him pay because of all the terrible things he did to them before. They didn't label him and, and minimize him and, and exclude him from the team. They embraced him right away. They encouraged his talents and abilities. They made sure that he knew that he was now a Chicago Bull and they were successful because of it. I know this is a simple illustration. But that's how God works as well. When you are playing for the other team and you are an enemy of Jesus, He didn't like that very much. Although He loved you, He didn't like you. You know, you don't have to like everybody. You do have to love everybody. But when you chose to be part of His team, oh man, it didn't matter. Because all those, those, those things that you did that were motivated wrongly, by the shed blood of Christ, you were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And all those gifts and talents and abilities were redeemed in Him. And you become a winner and part of the winning team. That's who we are. That's what Jesus does for us. As much as we were enemies of the cross before bowing our knee to Jesus, as soon as we do, we become His sons and daughters teammates with a new purpose in life. Again, I need to say this. Jesus paid our past sins. And now His grace, in spite of our flaws, is part of our testimony. As Paul continues to share his testimony, there's new news to us in here. Um, before, in the book of Acts, we don't know where he was when he received his call to his mission work. But now we realize he was in the temple. And so he's showing them, even though I'm a follower of Jesus at this point, I don't stop following Jewish law and traditions. I'm still worshiping in the temple. And when I'm in the temple, God says, I don't want you to minister in Jerusalem. If you've ever wondered before, that was always my question. Is Paul, who, who better was equipped to reach the Jews than Paul? I mean, he had the training with Gamaliel. He knew the ins and outs, all the rest. Why did God send him halfway across the world? God says they wouldn't accept your testimony. You can't stay in Jerusalem. And it didn't make sense to Paul. He says, but I'm the best equipped. He said, I did all these terrible things. I was witness to Stephen stoning. The contrast of my life then and my life now would be undeniable. And it's true, it would have been undeniable. But here's the thing about this world. His ministry would have been a short one, wouldn't it? Those in power who feel betrayed don't put up with those who flip sides and make them look bad. It's just a fact. God was sending Paul far away because of his education and training and ability to reach many people groups. And so where God sends you may not make sense to you, but it will be exactly where you're designed to go. Exactly where you're designed to go. You know, the young people in the room... You may want to stay in Morgantown the rest of your life. And God says, nah. No. I've got better places for you to go. Places I've designed for you. And some of you may be itching to leave and God says, nope. Morgantown is the place for you. Those of us who are older and like a little more stability, right? We're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm good. Life is great. I love my church. I love my community. I'm good, and God says, nope, go to Hungary, go to South America, go where I lead you, go to Missouri, it might seem like South America to some, go, go where I send you. You see, that is the life of a believer. We hold nothing back from God. 
We hold everything with an open hand, and that way, if we have an open hand, instead of fighting against him, he can take our hand and lead us where we need to go. Up to this point, the crowd has been completely and totally quiet, just taking it in. They haven't rioted against a thing that Paul has said. They didn't riot when he said that Jesus was alive, that he appeared and spoke to Paul. But as soon as they hear that Paul has been sent to deliver the good news to the Gentiles, they begin to yell, rip off their clothes, and throw dust in the air. Why? Why is that the trigger for the, cr- for the crowd? Because everyone wants grace and hope for themselves, but no one wants grace for their enemy or who they deem their enemy. That's why Jesus says, if, if you don't forgive your brother and sister, I can't forgive you. This grace is for everyone. It's not exclusive. It's inclusive. And so if you have a wall or a barrier, I can't reach your heart. You know, I'm so tired of politics. I've shared with you before that I'm not even watching the news anymore. But this is the kind of thing we're seeing in our political realm, right? It's not enough to defeat your political foe. You've got to silence them completely. You can't even, you've got to make sure they can't ever run for office again. And then anyone who's supported to them is blacklisted for life. That's how the world works. That's how the world we live in. And that's why some of, some of you are so disheartened all the time, right? Like we see injustice, and we see anger, and we see no grace, and, and we see people pointing fingers. One group is pointing fingers at the other group, and, and you need to change, and you need to change, and they're all wrong. But in Christ, in Christ, there's grace and forgiveness. In the world, there's grace and forgiveness for me and not for you. Paul's message is hijacked by the hate of those who are listening. They hate their Roman oppressors. They hate the Gentiles who are a threat to their customs and way of life. They hate change. And Paul bringing the gospel message to the Gentiles stirs up all these hostile feelings that have nothing really to do with Paul. It's just their anger at life and situation and they're done with him. It seems like everything he's said up to this point is lost, right? This is our greatest fear, isn't it? This is why we don't share our faith. Because we may say something that will cause a trigger in that individual to where they're going to be angry or rude or mean to us. And we don't want to feel that way. Let me tell you this, guys. That wasn't a wasted testimony. For a few short minutes... He got to tell his story. For a few short minutes, he got to tell them about the grace and love of Jesus. No matter how ultimately they received it, they still heard it. And no matter what happened to him in the future, every time they see Paul or hear about Paul, you know, news travels quickly in Jerusalem, right? Every time Paul comes up, on the news ticker, or in a conversation, they're going to remember what he said. And so we don't share our faith for how it's received in the moment. It takes time for a seed to produce fruit. Remember Stephen? What happened to Stephen after he shared his testimony? They dragged him outside and stoned him to death. And Paul approved of it. But... When Paul saw Jesus on the road to Damascus and was blind for three days, guess who he thought about? Guess who was the one person in his life that gave him the clearest testimony as to who Jesus was? And now, as Paul is sharing his own testimony, who's part of his testimony? Stephen! Do you see? Remember your own journey of faith. When you came to Jesus... Was it just one person telling you? Or was it a praying grandmother who wore out the carpet from her knees praying for you? Was it a neighbor kid 
who asked you about Jesus? Was it a parent? Was it a teacher? Was it a stranger on the street? Was it all of them? You're one piece of the puzzle. Yes, but God is taking the time to bring all these things together. So today, I just want to encourage you, make the most of every opportunity. Meet people where they are. Seek to speak their language. Don't attack them, but relate to them. Find their good motives of their heart that you can encourage. And then show them how Jesus has transformed your own heart and life. They may not react positively in the moment, but the story goes on. That seed will get in their heart. I've had people tell me about different messages that I've preached or taught that have shaped their life, and I don't even remember. They tell me specifics, and I'm like, really, I said that? I had a buddy in college. We were trying to do like one of those home group things, like, like small group Bible studies in the dorm. And we had these elaborate plans of how great it was going to be and how many times we were going to meet and all the rest. We met once. But what I shared in that one meeting stuck with this guy. And he can tell me to this day what I taught. And I was a college student who was there for media and didn't know he was going to be a pastor. So, guys, this is what it means to follow Jesus. Don't go through with blinders. I know with COVID and everything else going on in life, we just want to get through our day, right? But where are you finding yourself? Maybe your bubble is a lot smaller. Maybe it's just you in the house and your phone. Make the most of every opportunity. This is a season where God is about to pour out His Holy Spirit on all flesh where the church is being set ablaze, where the world is going to hear the gospel, and then Jesus will return. We are in the last days. So let's learn from Paul. Jesus, I thank you for your word and your, your teaching and your message, Lord. Thank you for giving us clear examples of, of the best way to tell people about you, Lord. We always make things more complicated and more convoluted. And we, we want to quantify what we do by how it's received. But, Jesus, we remember that many times when you taught, you were rejected immediately. You, you taught in your hometown, and they wanted to throw you off a cliff. You revealed yourself in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they still arrested you and took you. They fell at, the, at, at you saying that I am He, and yet they still didn't believe, Lord. And yet, we see that you win in the end. That the grace that we've received that has taken us from destructive patterns that are, were leading us straight to the depths of hell, terrible things that we've said and done, wrong attitudes that we have that deserved extreme punishment, when we came to you, you loved us and forgave us. And so today, Lord, if there's anybody in the room that is not where they need to be with you. Help them to realize, God, that all it takes is for them to say, I'm sorry, Jesus. I have wandered from you. I've made a mess. Take me back. And Jesus, let them experience the full reality of the Gospel that says their sin is as far as the east is from the west. Their lives are as white as snow. Help them to experience that new life. Holy Spirit, do a work in us during this season as never before. In your name we pray. Amen. As always, we're going to have our time of worship. And uh, I encourage you all to, uh, if you feel led, come to the altar or just pray in your seat. But we're going to take some time to reflect and worship Jesus.